Welcome everyone. This is my pro industry interview with Daniel Pasos or Pathos, like I would say, from Spain. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> oh my gosh. So um, this is Leslie Kristen, and I am so proud. I'm going to call you a friend, even though we really haven't been like close, but we've worked together a couple of times. Absolutely. And um, Daniel lives in Fort Lauderdale, and he is an unbelievable makeup artist. And I wanted to interview him because I adore his work, and it is, it's gorgeous. You are a fashion and editorial makeup artist, and um, it's just, I wanted to, well, before I get into it, <laughs> Cause I always wanted to be an editorial makeup artist, but I ended up working more in film. And um, so you get to do pretty much a lot of the stuff that I had always dreamed about doing. And, you know, living in South Florida, I think that there's definitely a lot of opportunity for that too. But I wanted to read a little bit of your bio because, um, you know, Daniel has, so you, it, it seems like you started, which, you know, we'll, talk about that of course um in in 98 and kind of like as as an artist for a lot of different cosmetic brands yeah yeah but then like your editorial list is vogue russia l serbia l for czech republic l for germany glamour for india glamour for bulgaria are you guys like drooling do you want this resume <laughs> Playboy Magazine, we'll have to talk about that. Condé Nast Traveler, fabulous. Um, I mean, just, it goes on and on and on. And then, of course, you have um, Women's Golf Journal. That's where we met. We're yes, on yes. Paul, I'm Paula Kramer, yes. And um, and we also and, worked on Annika, Annika Soren, Sorensen. That's, that's right. Yes, we did Sor Annika Sorensen. 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 Yes, yes, we did both of them together. And um, and I was makeup, and he was hair. But Daniel is is both, which I definitely, even though I'm licensed to do hair, um, please don't hire me for that. <laughs> 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 I just won't. Uh, <laughs> I am not the one for you. Um, I love this. You've done Ted Baker, one of my favorite. I love Ted Baker. Um, yeah, that was. Yes, um, House of Fraser. I mean, you've got so many Etienne Agne or Agner, as they would say in the states. Um, you've done like Keratin Complex hair things as well. So you you've kind of had like the combination of all different you've done miami swim week and uh new york fashion week so you've done like lots and lots of stuff i know you've been in the business for a long time and um and so i wanted to you know i just wanted to have you share with us a bit of your journey kind of how you got started doing makeup and um you know what what took you there <laughs> Okay, so when I was around 23 years old, I think, um, up to that point, I had only worked in music stores because I knew that I loved music. So, you know, I was out of high school. I was working in predominantly, I would say, like little retail things, retail jobs. And I worked selling, you know, music, like CDs. I was, you know, let's say that was what interested me or something like that, right? Yeah. Then when I was about, um, I, I kind of found myself, uh, paying attention to um, runway shows on TV sometimes and noticing the really cool makeup. Um, and then I was noticing like the covers of magazines before celebrities took over, there was still like the really cool edgy makeup that they would have on the covers of magazines. And I remember I started paying attention to that and I was thinking I could always draw. I was a good artist, you know? And I was like, I wonder if I could learn how to do that. I wonder if I could learn how to do makeup. It just looks like it's really cool. You know, just, and I feel like that's something that a lot of uh, makeup artists have in common is that th there's like this organic um, sense of admiring beauty. Yeah. And, and then you realize, why don't I do something about it? Why don't I see where this could take me? Yeah. 
So I think for me, I started in the retail, which is a way a lot of people start in this business. I started in retail mm -hmm. and I was the, like, you know, the only guy behind the counter at a Lancome counter. And I remember I was like nervous as hell first, you know, um, first week or two weeks. And it was kind of weird, but um, I got over it and I kept learning and I was passionate about it. And I think like the women, even that when I started, could see that I really, really loved this. Oh, you know? and you know, women will buy anything from a man. <laughs> right. I, I did sure. have those. Your yeah, sales were have, probably far better than others. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is, you know, back in, like you said, uh, 1998 and I worked for Lancome. That was my first makeup line. And I would get excited when all the national makeup artists were coming into the store and I would watch them do makeup. And, you know, we were just helping them out and we would be selling behind the counter, but I wanted to be in their position. You know, I wanted to be the one that was, you know, um, working on, you know, it, you know, there was the customers, but it was just like so cool, you know, like I'm watching all this makeup and you know, it was just like great, you know, so it was amazing. Mm -hmm. That's so fun. So then, then uh -huh. go ahead. All right. No, no, no go ahead. Say, so, so you went from retail and then what was your next step after that? Right. So, so what happens in this business uh, is that nobody really tells you how to get into it. So um, I, once I was, I worked for Lancome for a couple of years and I worked for Mac, Mac Cosmetics, mm -hmm. uh, kind of jumped the gun. I did a little bit of Bobby Brown Cosmetics too for a while. Then I went to work for Mac. And then when I worked for Mac, there was a model that was buying makeup for me one day behind the counter and she was beautiful. And I remember like telling her, you're a model, right? You're so gorgeous, you know, whatever. Cause I, I was not used to seeing like you know, beautiful Amazonian, you know, girls, you know, because that's what separates how we say real people and models, right? They just look different. They're different. You know, that's why they're models. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember just being like, you know, like blown away. And she's like, yeah, actually, I am a model. And I'm um, with this, um, you know, uh, agency in Fort Lauderdale, blah, 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 whatever. So I was like, oh, um, well, if you ever need a makeup artist, I would love, and I didn't even want any money. I just wanted to be able to work with her because she was just so pretty. And I, I was like, you know, why don't I, you know, that would be such a cool thing to do. So we exchanged um, numbers after she bought some products. And then I think she called me maybe like uh, two weeks later or something and said, listen, I have a photo shoot and I need a makeup artist. I don't think there's a budget for this one, but if you're interested in doing it, I would love to have you come on board. So that was my very, very first test. Yeah. And that was, that was back before it was digital. That was film. Mm. So your makeup had to be perfect. Yes. I mean, it was like, um, you know, we were still using lip liner on a lot of people back then because now the, the, the industry has gotten away from everything became you know, more natural. Mm -hmm. And, um, but back when it was film, you had to do everything perfectly because it was not going to be retouched. So and there weren't all those filters, I mean, there were filters, but it was, you know, it, it, yeah, it was different, different. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I went there, I ended up doing her makeup very natural makeup, you know, very clean. We're in, we're in Florida, South Florida. People have to remember that. And commercial agencies uh, for models, these modeling agencies, and even as far as us, we're concerned, makeup and hair has to be done in a very natural way. Okay. The, the, we'll talk about that, I guess, I guess as we go further in it, into it. But I ended up doing her makeup that day and a male model. I just powdered him and put maybe like a little bit of concealer underneath his eyes. And um, it was just fun. And I got pictures out of it. You know, I mean, they weren't in, in my book for very long, but at least it was something, my first step towards doing this. Yeah. And then, and then after I worked with a couple of photographers, I kind of figured out that um, you have to assist in this business and that's how you really get your foot in. You have to assist other makeup artists that are established who've been there, who've done things. And that's really the way that I kind of got in eventually, but it took me a long time to even assist. I mean, I was doing makeup for like over 10 years before I even started assisting. So, I mean, it was like, that's how, how, how much this business, I think now less, now you can get into this business way easier by ways of Instagram and social media that didn't exist when I started doing makeup. Right. So that's what's right. changed in this business, you know, for sure is, um, is that, you know? So, um, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that the, the market is, is very different and there's just, there, there are jobs that didn't exist before. Mm -hmm. Um, but I still think that, you know, to, to make it and kind of like you're saying, you know, there, there is, 
there's, you know, all of these, especially like the, you know, the Pat McGraths and the, you know, the, like we were talking about, like the Kevin O'Quan, like they, they, they've all gone through the steps, you know, it's not just, yeah. oh my God, I've got 3 million followers and all of a sudden I'm somebody. It's Cor like correct. It's changed com completely, completely. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely now it's, it's um, like, especially if you are, um, what are they called? I mean, not just a blogger, but a makeup enthusiast. Yeah, uh, an influencer. That applies makeup, right, influencer, and you put makeup on yourself the whole time, which some of those people are super talented. Um, mm -hmm. In the beginning, when it first happened, I kind of didn't get it. I didn't get what they were what they were doing and what it was all about. But I then I understood that it was part of the whole YouTube generation of people coming into the industry and learning that way. Um, but yeah, definitely. Uh, it was any, you know, you had no followers back then. <laughs> you basically had, had to pave the payment, uh, pave the, the pavement or whatever, and get your portfolio going. And then that's how you were recognized as a makeup artist. It wasn't because you were on social media. It wasn't because you could do all these different looks on yourself and gain followers that way. I mean, it's completely different. Mm -hmm. So in a way, they have it a lot I don't know if I should say it's a lot easier, but it's so different. But I think that you can definitely get more instant exposure nowadays where mm -hmm. you couldn't do that. You couldn't do that back then. So it's so different. It is. It is how you get hired. And even I think the, the, the desire, and we had spoken about this before a little bit. Um, you know, I think it's kind of twofold and I think a lot of, you know, a, a lot of the younger ones, um, they they want to go from here to here, <laughs> just right. fast without without yeah. building the skill and and you know you don't know what you don't know if you can't see, like you were saying you know even if it's a clean, beautiful and I'll show your Instagram page in a little bit but the amount of work that's required to have a detailed eye versus putting a whole bunch of layers of crap and then putting filters over it. Oh, I hate that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's not, that's yeah. not a skilled makeup artist. No, no, I don't like the whole filter thing. And that's a whole nother topic. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's a, that's, that's something that, um, you know, in this Insta world, they don't necessarily know. I, I see that a lot, you know, it's, it's like, you still have to, it's, it's amazing. And like you said, you know, you had, you worked with that model and you did that and it didn't stay in your portfolio for a long time because no. you started to see like, Oh yeah, I, you know, and, and that's what you do. You're constantly like taking things out of your portfolio. So that <laughs> it's funny, but that's, that's part of, you know, growing as an artist, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, uh, it, the whole Instagram thing, I mean, I have like a love hate relationship with Instagram. I'm not going to lie. Um, I'm not the best of always putting behind the scenes. Um, I kind of just post what I want to post. I don't do it because I'm trying to appease a certain audience. Mm -hmm. I don't care about that. Um, I think that it's really important to post what you want to post, what you're proud of, what you think is beautiful. Um, and I also think that some people fall into the category or the mistake of thinking that they have to have a lot of followers in order to be taken seriously. And then they, they kind of lose their, you know, again, I'm not passing judgment, but I'm not one for buying uh, tons of followers for your page because you think that you're going to get more followers that way. I don't think that's the way it should be done. I think that you should organically grow, grow your Instagram, just like you would do your own business. Um, by slowly posting things and, and um, using a lot of hashtags. And that's how, and you know, when I first started, I barely had any, not that I have so many, but you know, I think I have like three, a little over 3000 or something like that. I don't have like a whole lot because I don't post every day anyway. And I don't do a million hashtags. I only post what, you know, do the kind of hashtags that I think are relevant to what I'm posting and my page. Mm -hmm. But that's like what I think we should talk about too is, um, you know, you should be real in your content. You should, it should reflect who you are. Um, and don't be so quick to think you have to buy, you know, 20,000 followers or, you know, all this stuff and that you're going to get instant fame or instant work. It doesn't work that way. Put the work into it and then you're going to get, you're going to reap what you sow when you put the work into it. That's how I, I mean, that's my philosophy. I'm not, I'm not, 
I'm not knocking anybody if they want to buy followers. I mean, you know, that's your thing. It's cool. But, you know, I took me six years to get the amount of followers I have now being on Instagram. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I'm proud of that. I'm proud of the fact that I know that all those people, all those people hit follow because they wanted to. Mm -hmm. Not because I bought them or I, I told them to. You know what I mean? Right. So, but again, you know, some of these big people, these big um, brand artists and all that kind of stuff, they have a lot of pressure also to have a lot of followers. So I know that sometimes there's times where they, they buy followers. I know that. Mm -hmm. And they have the bots, like the things that go and follow other people's accounts. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of that going on. I mean, I don't fall into that category and that's why I have a substantial amount. I don't have like a crazy amount of followers because I, that, that's just not my, you know, my thing. Well, it's, it's, it's a part or full-time job to be on social media. That's for sure. And mm -hmm. um, I think um, that when you're busy working, making mm -hmm. a living at doing makeup, you don't have time to be posting no, seven no. on social media. <laughs> and us old school people, us old school people that have been doing this for a while, I'm so concerned about being on set and doing a good job that I don't want to be on my phone. And sometimes the clients will give those artists a look like, what are you doing? Yeah. Like, get off your phone. Because you're supposed to pay attention to your job and look at the monitor and make sure the makeup is right, make sure the hair is right. You know, you you can't um, be on your they're phone. They're paying the whole time. you for. They're paying it's you for. Yeah, it's unprofessional. If you're a cel I get it. A lot of these celebrity makeup artists and those people, it's all about the experience and the glam and this and that, and that's a whole nother category. <laughs> but the regular, you know, because I even though I've done celebrities and I've I've sent you the list, I believe I think we mm -hmm. talked about it. Um, but I mean, I've done them. But I if I don't do celebrities every single day on a regular basis, I'm not going to call myself a celebrity makeup artist. I don't think that that's the proper, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, you've done celebrities. You can put that on your resume. That's great. But I don't, I wouldn't go ahead and say well, I'm a celebrity makeup artist just because I've done one celebrity or two celebrities. Right. I mean, that's just, you know. And it, there's, there's so many different um, avenues, you know, like there, there's, celebrities within music there's celebrities within models there's celebrity within yeah you know, film there's celebrities with you know so the, so it and then you really start to kind of get into your niche as well just like you know just like you said between working at Longco mac and then bobby brown and laura mercier those are four completely different brands and philosophies and culture yeah yeah right. yeah and, and you see you, you know you soak it all in like a sponge and you take what you want from each you know from each brand but i i would tell people that retail for me i mean it's changed now i know it's not the same retail environment that it was 20 years ago when i was working in it but i would be i would tell them that um it's a it's a really cool thing to be able to get in to start touching people's faces and get used to you know if you go to makeup school that's awesome if you can get to that too that's great and they, people just go to makeup school they don't even go into the retail route but, but that was my route and I'm proud of it and I think that I got to work with real women and see like what you, I, how to make real women look beautiful first before I started doing models because models you're gonna have different things that you can do on them you can do almost anything but the majority of the jobs that I've worked on these commercial print jobs or advertising the least you can put on them for the camera they'll they love you it's very seldom that it goes the other way around unless it's bridal like a bridal brand and it's more makeup and it, again that depends on the lighting mm -hmm. it depends on what kind of light they're going to use that shows the makeup so all that stuff depends but the majority of the time if you can keep her looking beautiful as she walked in and enhance her a little bit and not go crazy with the foundation and not make her look you know, go overboard on it, they'll love you. That's how the, that's the majority of the jobs. Well, the jobs that you and I worked on actually, because that was a golf magazine. I mean, they, they hired me because that's my style. Not because I do a whole bunch of like over the top kind of makeup. Yeah. And, yeah. And so that, now, if it were, you know, I'm not a Mac makeup artist. I never worked at Mac. I'm not, right. you know, that's, definitely much more of a theater and it's funny because a lot of makeup artists that that started there and then went into editorial they had to retrain themselves once they got oh, an agent yeah they see had the difference to... 
Yeah, the difference with me was, okay, so like, that's a thing that, okay, so Ma Max Reputation, it's funny to me, because Max Reputation is because of their advertising, that they're so avant-garde and they had bold colors and all that. But that's really depends on where you started with them and what market, because uh, the market that I worked in, I worked in Aventura Mall, which is like the suburb. Mm -hmm. So the people that we got wanted natural makeup. Nobody ever wanted, like back then, like, you know, dark black eyeliner all around their eye. We never got that. And the, like, they got that years later as the community grew and the mall grew. But I was doing natural makeup at MAC, but the thing was that I had that skincare background from Lancome first. So mm -hmm. I remember like a lot of the makeup artists when I was working with them, they were super talented. I mean, there was some sick people that I worked with in the beginning, but, but they were like noticing that I was taking time to put like the cream on and all that stuff. And I was working with the skin. They're like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I love, prepping the skin first before I put the foundation on and you know and I remember like to them they were just so used to just doing color and they would like just smack on the studio fix yeah or whatever yeah. and like yeah they would like do like these insane eyes like bold beautiful makeup but mm -hmm. then when it came to the skin that was where they like you said they had to retrain themselves on how to do proper skin and yeah all that kind of stuff well so, a lot yeah. of times you know I I mean I'm I remember when Mac started, like we would order Mac on the phone from Canada when I was working in film. That's how old I am. <laughs> you know? Yeah, like it, it was owned by the two Franks. You yeah. would, yeah, yeah, you would buy it, it so on the phone. It was such a magical, it was so different back then, yeah. Absolutely, and you know, it was really like it, you know, RuPaul was the first spokesperson for Mac. So, you know, yeah. a lot of times it was like covering up beards and, and, you know, it was, it came from, from that era of, um, very almost theatrical and coming myself coming from film, I never used Mac foundations. I always liked their lipsticks and eyeshadows, but their foundations because of film, it wasn't video, it was film you wanted skin to look beautiful and you would especially didn't want, like you could see that on a massive screen, all of these layers of foundation. So yeah, I, a lot of the artists weren't trained on, on, on doing like they, they knew color theory, but they didn't always, you know, they, they were just so like into studio fix. Like even yeah. though they had foundations that you could, they, they could pass for skin if applied the right way, like the matte foundation and the satin foundation. But Unfortunately, they were known, like you said, for the heavier, like the full coverage and the, mix, mm -hmm. the Mac stores and then the studio fix. So yeah, a lot of their artists could just, amazingly talented artists, but right, they, they, the skin was, was not really focused back then. Now mm -hmm. I think they have an effort to do that more, but back then, yeah, it was. Probably, yes. That, and so it's so interesting. There's just so many avenues and so many you know places. So I wanna hear, so when did you, um, kind of transition like full time into doing and how did you decide on editorial did you just kind of like fall in love with it or or how did that yeah yeah I mean I think the editorial never like it, it doesn't go away like you're always trying to do more and more and, and you know because you just you just love doing you know doing them all the time I, for a while I did them back to back for like I'd say a good four or five years that's all I did was back to back editorial that's why I did so many but then I kind of tapered off I, you know I, I wasn't doing those editorials as, as much I think that you go through little lulls and you're you know what I mean but um so I think I was like you where I was like I really want to do this I'm looking at magazines and I'm like this is so cool I want to do this kind of makeup I, you know it's so I think what eventually happened was I started calling modeling agencies and asking if I could test with their models. And then so I started testing with more models, started putting more things in my book. Again, not being given any advice of how to guide my career, doing this all on my own, <laughs> not really, really, and wasting a lot of money putting images in my book that I thought were supposed to sell me as a makeup artist and not really understanding what really needs to be put in your portfolio, not what I was putting in it. So I spent a lot of my own money because I didn't have an agent yet. Um, I didn't have anybody directing, uh, giving me advice on my career. I didn't have anybody like that. So I was kind of just from the seat of my pants, just, just saying, oh, this just looks great. This, they're, they're gonna love this. Let me put this in my book, let me do. And it's, that's not the way the business works. Like they have an eye, they know what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's so important uh, to have the right models in your book. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the models have changed 
uh, drastically now with Instagram. There's a lot of different, which is good. I'm all for inclusion. There's all kinds of models now, not just from ethnicities, but we have like a lot more plus size models we're using in the industry, which I think is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, the, the trend of shorter girls that's still going on, you know, like girls don't have to be 5'10 anymore, like, you know, a long time ago. Um, so there's been a lot of inclusion in the industry, which I think is great. But um, back then, when I first started, they were like, why is this girl on, on your card? Why do you have this on your book? And I'd be like, oh, because the makeup, I'm like, they're like, no, it doesn't matter how good the makeup is, you need to have the right model. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so that's how, you, you know, I learned like, okay, well, I need to start doing, taking this to another level. So then as I was testing, um, I, I became closer with the photographers, photographers liked me. They made me work for free in the beginning. I didn't get paid right away. I think I did like, like, um, you know, I had to work with the photographer like three or four times before they finally started agreeing to pay me because, you know, they just were trying to say, oh, you need experience. They knew that those, those pictures were going in the model's book and on her comp card. So if they're good enough to go in her comp card and in her book, I'm good enough to get paid. So that was, you know, it's funny. That's you how that, people, right? <laughs> yeah. So it was kind of frustrating in the beginning because I was like, I wanted to start getting, you know, you love it and you want to do it so badly that you don't even think about get, making money out because you're young, you know, when you're young, you don't think about that stuff. And that was me too. I was like, I want to do this so badly that I don't care if I get paid. And then you realize mm, if I want to pay my rent and I want to pay my bills, yeah, this is a business. And then you realize that it's art and commerce. So that's what people have to understand. The, the beauty business is art and commerce. So that's when, you know, I started um, getting paid, did a lot of paid tests for like years. I would just do paid tests. I mean, I'm, I can't even tell you how many model tests I've, I've done. I mean, hundreds of model tests where, you know, there'd be a new girl coming to the agency and she needed all, all brand new shots. And I would, you know, and the thing was that they didn't want to pay two people. So everybody kept telling me, why don't you do hair? just do hair, Daniel, you know, you're, you, you know, and so I found myself in a position where everybody kept asking me and I was afraid that if I just did hair on my own and didn't get licensed for it, what if like, you know, something happened and I couldn't do this anymore and I wanted to have something to fall back on in case I wanted to work in a salon or I wanted to do whatever. So I took it upon myself to start doing, to go to, to you know, to beauty school. Yeah. And so I got licensed for beauty school. Um, and again, and, and, I did kind of do that in, in um, people wanting me to do both. I'll be honest. That's why I did the hair. But well, you're you more gonna... viable, you know? You're more viable. They're, They're going to have... hire you way before they'll hire just, you know, two people because it's a double budget. Yeah, people don't right. seem to understand that there's a budget on jobs. And <laughs> a lot of, yeah, sometimes the client is awesome and they'll say like you know what well you're gonna do the makeup we'll have you as a makeup artist we'll, we'll hire somebody else for hair but sometimes they'll be like can you do both because we don't want to pay this is our budget and we don't want to pay somebody else to come and, and do um you know we want to pay you to do both things mm -hmm. that's how it is sometimes mm -hmm. and if you want to work and you want to eat um you know you, you, you got to make that decision am i willing to do that you know so I think that's what happened to me. But then I started liking hair. You know, I, 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 I like it. I think my make my passion for makeup is stronger, but, but, um, but, you know, but, but, but hair is art as well. So, I mean, I like hair also, but if I had to choose one, yeah, I'd probably just try to continue being a better makeup artist. I'm not going to lie, you know? So. Yeah. Well, and that's, you know, like in, in, in the road that I took where, when you have to join the union, because I, I went down more of the road of working on, you know, film and television and whatnot. You, once you join the union, you have to choose. You can't do both anymore. So Right, so, right. That's yeah. the difference with television. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, and a lot of times people that like to do both, um, they may choose, oh, okay, well, you know, I mean, there seem to be more makeup artists and hairstylists. I mean, hair for film is not easy because you have to know. Oh, so no, much you have to know. Yeah. Big, yeah, big, yeah. You know, it's, it's, there's and even, ed, even editorial hair, even though I can do some editorial hair, because a lot of it is about, is about just kind of putting texture in the hair, uh -huh. a certain type of texture. Um, and sometimes it's a little, little bit of an easier, looser feel. That's the difference between like, let's say editorial hair versus real hair. 
like real women hair. Mm -hmm. But then there's like that level of editorial hair where like you said, it's like, you need to know how to like, you know, almost like construct a wig on your own and like, you know, and, and that's where like, I, I can do a wig, you know, I can put a wig on somebody, I can cut a wig, I can dye a wig, I can do all that stuff and I've done it for shoots. But when it comes to like creating the wig or, you know, all that, I, I don't do that. You know what I mean? So there's a limit to where I'm going to go. You know what I mean? And, you know, I'm okay with finger waves, but I'm not like the best. So like, if it, like, let's say the shoot was all flappers, you know, like people, you know, I, I would have a hard time. I would need somebody strong in hair to help me also because that wouldn't be my shoots. You know, I've done a little couple things here and there with period hair, but you know, I'm not an expert on finger waves, yeah. you know? Yeah. So it just, you know, it's, it, 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 you know, there's a limit, there's a limit to what you can, you can bring. And it's important for you to tell your agency or whoever's hiring you what you can and can't do, because yeah. you don't want to be in a situation where you're like, oh yeah, I can do this. And then you show up and you suck and then they never want to hire you again. Absolutely. You know? Yes. Yeah. I, um, and a lot of times, you know, because there is a particular budget and, you know, they, they had called me to, it was this, this, amazing it would have been a great opportunity you know had I been a lot younger and really you know didn't have my company and whatnot but it was great it was like doing weddings and they would take you on all these cruises and you go to Paris and you go to you know these but I was like you know I am not your updo bridal girl like if I can do makeup I can handle all kinds of you know, talents, difficult, you know. You, you know what it is but too also? Yeah, no, but see, same, I feel the same way. Like I can do an updo, I've done them, but I feel like if it's not executed with the same amount of diligence as I would take with a makeup, yeah. then yeah. I don't want to do it. I really honestly feel that way because I've seen people that do both for weddings and I'm, you know, of course I'm never going to mention no names, but <laughs> I see the work, the pictures, you know, like when I follow people that do, that do wedding hair on Instagram, they say they do both. And I can tell that the work suffers when they're doing both sometimes because either they're rushed or they're doing too many people, you know, on the occasion. And I see the quality not really living up for one or the other and that's why I don't want to you know that's why I'm like if I do an updo or I do that for a wedding I might do maybe like one or two people at the most where I do both things and then maybe do more makeup for the wedding I don't want to do something that I'm not going to feel I'm executing in the best way and that's going to be a representation of my work I that that's just the way I feel about it yes and and, and I agree with you a hundred percent because I'm I'm the same way I want to do what I know I do well and it's, I, I don't, I don't want to sell myself, even though somebody may really want you to do it. Yeah. I, I'm doing them a disservice. So a lot of times, and you know, for those of you that are listening to this, because there are the other side that it's like, oh, I can do this and I can do that. And I can do, you know, and, and half of it sucks, if not all of it. <laughs> and and you really want to be careful because you want to think of longevity in your business, not the cash that you're going to get at the end of the job. And I right. think that's so right. Well, quality. There, you have to think about quality. You have to think about um, your standard, your reputation. If you're marketing yourself, if you're marketing yourself, be careful how you market market yourself because it's like, am I a editorial artist? Am I this? Am I that? Or am I just a wedding? Not just a wedding. Am I am I a wedding? makeup artist or hairstylist, mm -hmm. but really think about it because people are going to pay attention to what you're telling them that you are and they're going to be looking at the work and they, everybody scrutinizes. Everybody looks at, at things and looks for the imperfections or the perfection. We all, we're, we all do that, you know? So, well, I mean, especially now, I mean, you know, you have pictures and all you do is go and that's what I do. Exactly. I just, yeah. open that up yeah. Yeah. And I look at everything and especially you know, especially, and because bridal, bridal's difficult, like, especially the style of having, you know, and again, I'm kind of going a little off topic, but, you know, when you hire somebody to do kind of like these pseudo disheveled, you know, beautiful Lucy hairstyles, 
and it falls apart yeah, in 10 exactly. minutes. <laughs> That's what I was gonna say. Yes. You could try to make it look that way, but if it's not gonna hold, then you didn't do it right. And I'm, I'm guilty of that. I've done that. I've done that. I've done people's hair where I'm like, I got this. And, you know, I go in with my pins and I do it. And it's like, oh, my God, this looks amazing. I take a picture of it. And then they tell me later on, well, it was beautiful, but it didn't really hold that well. Yeah. I, had to keep, I had to keep fixing it. And I don't want to hear that. I'm like, oh, great. That sucks. So, yeah, I need to get better at what I do. But that's why I might not do something that I don't feel uncomfortable with, you know, in the first place. And yeah. you, have, you shouldn't be afraid to say that. You know? Right. And because, and if anything, the bridal business is all about referral. I mean, it's so huge. So oh. it's like, oh my God, yeah, I looked great, but then it fell apart and I had like my hair. And then you have the pictures all throughout the night and the yeah. hair is like a disaster and they're yeah. all sweaty. <laughs> yeah, so it's, yeah, it's, yeah. Every, yeah, every area of, of our career and what we focus on really takes, um, you know, it, it takes a lot of effort and it takes learning the business, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You should definitely, um, you know, if you're, if you've got the instruction at school or whatever, and that's great and you're ready to start doing this, I think it's important to be on a team and try to assist somebody first mm -hmm. or be on a team of other hairstylists for weddings or other makeup artists for weddings and follow their lead and, and try to like, you know, learn that way. Don't just think that you can do everything yourself and be so quick to do that because sometimes, you know, learning that way could be really difficult and you might end up, you know, kind of tripping yourself up and, you know, it might not be pretty. So I think, you, you know. You are so gentle. <laughs> <laughs> you are so like, gentle. I'll you tell you, you are so, I. if you guys are watching, you definitely would want to work for Daniel and versus me. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, if you are not coachable, and humble, get out of my way. But I've, I've had those That's people too. I've had, I've had them too. I, I've had them too. Unfortunately, yeah, there's a lot of people that they want to um, fly before they could, or what is it? Um, jump before they can fly. I can't know. The, I don't know what to say. Fly before they can jump. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> um, I've had those people too. And they're super nice. And I didn't have a problem with their work actually. Like their work was okay. I already knew what I was getting. Like if they're new, I already knew, right. That wasn't the problem. The problem was them already kind of like dictating what they should and shouldn't be doing or, you know, like kind of like giving advice about other things that really is not of their concern. It's, it's my concern with the client. Yeah. So etiquette. that's, etiquette. yeah. Uh, set proper etiquette. proper set etiquette and and respecting the fact that you're there because of that person that put you there that hired you you know and namely that would be the client comes first then me and then I bring in an assistant so yeah it's really important to to know um, your place on set and yeah I am saying place I mean I'm just being honest um, yeah, there's a certain way of, of conducting yourself when you're an assistant and you know you could become friends with the person that you're assisting at some point but don't act like your friend right away because you know there's a certain way of protocol that you have to follow and that's why you're there you're there to learn as well you know and, and uh, you know you're it's really there important to be to that person's assistant you're there to be that right hand person and you want to be so humble and grateful to have that opportunity because yeah. when yeah. they work for someone like you they they're an extension of your reputation and if if they don't hold up to that it makes you look bad and they already have jeopardized ever working with you again and that's the reality of it because you yeah. can't risk having someone that doesn't know how to behave or how to even speak or not speak <laughs> right because you know you've we've spent too long working to get to where we are and so you really trust that other person when you're bringing them on and and i think that that's super important you know yeah and I, you have to you have to adjust yourself to the the way that person works too you know not every single artist is going to work the same way and that's okay i mean if you have a problem with something and something really bothers you if you're an assistant on a, with a certain artist and you just you're just not gelling with them or not clicking with them 
don't assist them and and you could you should you should say something as well it works both ways mm -hmm. but you should definitely understand that everybody works differently we all have different ways of, of working and either you're going to kind of get that and go with the flow or you're not and that's okay too but i mean but be under but understand that that that's part of the business you know it's like working with different personalities um you know different like, work styles like dating different people <laughs> Yeah, you might you might not like the way that I prep the skin. Like you might think that you should do it a different way. But the thing is that when you're assisting that person, you really should be doing it their way if they're telling you to, because that's the formula that works for them. When you're doing your own stuff, you could do it whatever way you want. But when you're assisting somebody else and you're on their platform, you have to have the respect to kind of do things their way, at least in the beginning. And then and then if you want to eventually go your own way and do it your own way, that's fine. But you know, just be open to, to different ways and not just everything has to also just be one way. So, yeah. And that's, I think, a, a naivete about the business. Um, and, you know, some people just like to be little know-it-alls and some people are really like sponges and very appreciative. And, yeah. and so attitude, you know, for those of you that are starting up in the business, I mean, you may not be the best makeup artist, but if you have a fantastic attitude, you may get further than the person that's actually more talented. I mean, it just really can vary so much. And, and some people like I love, there was a makeup artist that I worked with after I had, you know, done department head and King and, and, uh, and she was actually out of Fort Lauderdale and I loved assisting with her. I loved it because you know, she kind of handled all the stuff and, and, you know, I was just there to just help. And it's like, and she knew my work and I knew her work and it was just, and you, when you find that person that you can really work with well, it's like, ah, oh, it makes it, makes, yeah. it's so, you know, wonderful to work that way. Plus you're, you're learning so much too. Yeah, um, absolutely.